All right, so we're going to get started. Hello and welcome to today's JMCC ISHR cardiovascular webinar. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, just a few quick announcements before we turn things over to our speaker and chair for today's session. Uh, just a reminder that the North American Section ISHR meeting is coming up in June, June 27th to 30th in Madison, Wisconsin. So please save the date for this and keep an eye out for uh, additional information on the program and other exciting events for this meeting. Uh, if you've missed it, we've had a webinar last week through uh, JMCC Plus on the reproducibility and reporting of negative results. Uh, this coincides with a launch of a special call for papers in JMCC Plus on reproducibility. Uh, if you have missed this webinar, it will be on our YouTube channel, which I'll post a link to in the chat. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to our chair for today, Dr. Onora Knizakak. Just a reminder, uh, if you have questions for the speaker, please add them into the Q&A box and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so thank you again for joining us uh, and I'll turn it over. All right, thank you, Ron. Thank you for everyone coming today. Uh, we have a special guest today to uh, talk about his research, Andrew Gibb. Uh, we have known him for a while, but I'll give you, a, if you don't know him yet, let me give you a little bit background of what he did. He got his bachelor degree in Ohio University in 2009, and then uh, he had a little bit of uh, work in between, I believe, but he came back to science uh, as we like it. And then he got his PhD in 2017 uh, in physiology and biophysics at the University of Louisville with Dr. Brad Hill, uh, working on cardiomyocytes, metabolism, and exercise and published uh, circulation and several other authorships. Uh, and then he moved uh, and started working uh, with his postdoctoral uh, at the John Elrod uh, lab um, at the Temple University. Uh, and since then, he has done some seminal work on both uh, metabolism and fibroblasts and fibrosis in the heart. Um, he has literally cleared the table on awards and, and uh, speakers and, and publications. He has published in Circulation, Circulation Research, um, Jack, JCI, and got his pre-doctoral from AHA, F32 from NIH, and recently awarded CDA. Um, um, another uh, big thing about him is that he is a great speaker, um, and he has actually recently cleared the table at the ISHR meetings for the first uh, Young Investigator Award at the North American, and then later on in the World Congress, uh, Outstanding Young Investigator uh, Award uh, for speakers. So today he's going to talk about the glutamine and catabolism and its function in uh, fibroblast. Um, take it away, Gif. Thank you, owner, for that too kind introduction. Um, let me go ahead and get some sharing going here. Okay. You able to see that, owner? Yes. All right. Perfect. Okay, um, again, thank you, owner, and thank you to the JMCC uh, editorial board for the selection of this uh, manuscript um, for this and for this exciting webinar uh, series opportunity. So as we all know, heart failure is a clinical manifestation of numerous forms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, while there are several important pathophysiological mechanisms that contribute to heart failure, uh, a major one is cardiac fibrosis. Now, fibrosis is the excessive deposition of extracellular matrix, which is a complex meshwork of structural and non-structural proteins. In the heart, this primarily includes collagens, periostin, and fibronectin. Two types of cardiac fibrosis are typically found within the heart, uh, reactive interstitial, which forms and integrates between the viable cardiomyocytes. It's typically seen with hypertension, diabetes, and aging. And you can see this uh, visualized here in these hearts subjected to pressure overload where collagen is stained in uh, red by a picker serious red. Now, replacement or scarring fibrosis typically occurs when viable cardiomyocytes or tissue are lost due to injury, such as occurs during ischemic insults or in more severe cases, myocardial infarction. And the fibrosis acts to replace this lost cell area in the heart to maintain structural integrity. However, this accumulation of extracellular matrix profoundly, profoundly impacts cardiac function, mainly due to a loss of myocardial compliance or, oops, a little too fast, uh, loss of myocardial compliance or, you know, in simpler terms, um, the ability of the uh, myocardium to contract. 
Ultimately, uh, the success of fibrosis accelerates heart failure progression. Therefore, the clinical management of cardiac fibrosis presents a major challenge in improving survival rates in heart failure patients. Importantly illustrated here in a review by Tulquist and Mulkinton, uh, fibrotic initiation and expansion was found to occur from resident cardiac fibroblasts of the TCF21 lineage through elegant lineage tracing experience, experiments. Uh, while fibroblasts are always present in the heart, their activation and expansion and pressure overload, uh, shown here six weeks post-tac, um, can affect myocardial structure and function. In another cardiac fibroblast lineage tracing study uh, actually performed by owner, they define that these TCF21 tissue resident cardiac fibroblasts begin to express periostin, a secreted extracellular matrix protein, upon their stress-induced activation, and that this periostin-positive cell population is necessary for the adaptive healing and fibrosis in the heart. Now, these resident quiescent fibroblasts in the TCF, of the TCF21 lineage are important for cardiac development and homeostasis. In response to stress stimuli, such as profibrotic agonist TGF-beta, these fibroblasts become activated, resulting in migration to the site of injury, a proliferative burst, and the production of ECM components, such as periostin, which is an early marker of fibroblast activation. As these stress signals tend to be uh, chronic in cardiovascular disease, these fibroblasts fully differentiate into myofibroblasts, characterized by the de novo synthesis of alpha smooth muscle actin, excessive and unremitting production of ECM components, such as collagens, and are resistant to cell death. Interestingly, owner showed qualitatively that removal of ANG2 pumps from mice was sufficient to reduce alpha SMA staining in the heart, suggesting that it's possible for these myofibroblasts to revert to a less fibrotic state following removal of stress stimuli. This led to the possibility that targeting these signaling pathways mediating myofibroblast activation, differentiation, and persistence may impede or reverse fibrosis. Recent work from our lab identified that profibrotic stimulation results in a rapid upregulation of MICI-1 to reduce mitochondrial calcium uptake through the mitochondrial calcium unit order. This contributed to changes in cell metabolism, increasing oxidative phosphorylation and aerobic glycolysis simultaneously. Furthermore, we observed an increase in the bioavailability of alpha-ketoglutarate, a cofactor for lysine demethylases, which corresponded with changes in histomethylation and myofibroblast differentiation. However, several questions remained after these studies, such as identifying the primary metabolic uh, substrates, cellular origin of said substrates contributing to myofibroblast formation, and whether these metabolic pathways could be targeted therapeutically to treat fibrotic disease. Uh, first, we wanted to really understand how the epigenetic landscape is altered during myofibroblast activation and differentiation. To address this, we isolated cardiac, adult cardiac fibroblasts from three independent mice and differentiated them with TGF-beta for two, 24 hours. We then subjected these cells to ATAC sequencing, which uses a hyperactive TN5 transposase mutant to cleave accessible regions of the DNA while simultaneously adding adapter sequences, which can then be amplified and sequenced. We performed pairwise analysis with RNA sequencing in the same, from the same samples to assess chromatin accessibility and gene transcription changes. From our ATAC sequencing data set, we observed a global increase in chromatin accessibility 24 hours post-TGF beta, as indicated here by this volcano plot. Coordinating these changes in chromatin accessibility with changes in gene transcription, uh, 236 of the 254 genes increased in expression were also associated with an increase in accessibility, as one would expect. Interestingly, however, 456 of the 491 genes found to be downregulated were also associated with enhanced accessibility. Conversely, a decrease in accessibility appears to play no role in the context of TGF-beta-mediated gene programming, as we observed almost no overlap uh, between these two data sets. Uh, in performing gene ontology analysis of these overlapping sets, we found numerous processes uh, that we would typically associate with myofibroblast activation, uh, such as cell adhesion, migration, inflammation, collagen biosynthesis, and organization. So collectively, these observations are important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, this data suggests that while chromatin accessibility is required for TGF-beta-mediated increases and decreases in gene transcription, the fibrotic gene program activation and silencing likely lies at the level of DNA and transcription factor binding. 
Now, metabolism connect is a critical mediator of DNA and transcription factor binding as various metabolites themselves directly act as cofactors for epigenetic modifiers. For example, alpha ketoglutarate is a critical cofactor for alpha ketoglutarate dependent lysine demethylases, the activity of which we have previously shown to be necessary for TGF beta induced myofibroblast formation. Now, while we have previously identified increased alpha ketoglutarate abundance during myofibroblast formation and that histone demethylation is necessary for the activation of the fibrotic gene program, the metabolic substrates contributing to alpha ketoglutarate and whether these substrates are necessary for differentiation remained unknown. To determine which substrates contribute to increased alpha ketoglutarate bioavailability, we utilized isotopic label glucose or glutamine to determine how these substrates incorporate into intermediary metabolism during myofibroblast differentiation. Now, briefly, just to describe how this works for anyone unfamiliar with uh, carbon tracing experiments, uh, we can use synthesized carbons with an extra neutron, uh, which significantly increases its overall mass. Now, this increase in mass can be detected via mass spectrometry and allows us to determine where these carbons, uh, for example, from glucose, as shown here, end up in downstream metabolites via the metabolism of that substrate. And importantly, um, this analysis is only going to uh, provide relative levels of uh, how uh, fractional enrichment um, and not act actual absolute abundances. And so when we visualize this, uh, this is just representation here, um, but this graph is representing the entire pool of alpha ketoglutarate within our sample. Um, for the sake of simplicity, a decrease in the uh, zero isotope log indicated here uh, over time indicates that less alpha ketoglutarate uh, exists that is not labeled with a heavy carbon. Um, and then this is accompanied by an increase in the uh, other isotope logs or the number of heavy carbons found uh, in a given metabolite. Uh, based on a time course experiment, uh, time course labeling experiment that we did, which uh, I'm not showing here, but is within the manuscript, um, our results suggested to us that 12 hours of incubation of labeled glucose and one hour incubation with labeled glutamine uh, were optimal dynamic labeling times to allow us to assess any potential changes in relative pathway flux following TGF beta mediated activation and differentiation in our in vitro model system. Fractional enrichment, 24 hours uh, post-TGF beta revealed increased labeling in glycolytic intermediates and uh, downstream end products such as pyruvate and lactate, um, 24 hours post-TGF beta indicating increased rates of aerobic glycolysis. Uh, no inter glycolytic intermediates were observed in our labeled glutamine experiments, uh, which would indicate that there's no gluconeogenic capacity of these fibroblasts. Now, while aerobic glycolysis was significantly increased, incubation of fibroblasts with our labeled glucose uh, revealed little to no glucose oxidation in the naive or differentiated state, uh, as indicated by low isotopolog enrichment. When labeled glutamine was provided in a separate set of experiments, however, uh, in as little as one hour, we observed a significant increase in labeling of Krebs cycle intermediates, specifically alpha ketoglutarate, which was enhanced with TGF beta treatment indicating increased biosynthesis, uh, which was supported by our measurements of the relative absolute abundances of, of this same metabolites within our cells. Uh, importantly, this increase in Krebs cycle intermediate biosynthesis uh, occurred at a rate 12 times faster than glucose labeling, indicating the rapidity and likely importance of glutaminolysis in myofibroblast metabolism. Now, in addition to its contributions to alpha ketoglutarate biosynthesis, there are several possible means by which glutamine could contribute to myofibroblast differentiation. Uh, for example, glutaminolysis uh, likely regulates proline and collagen biosynthesis, and these are necessary processes uh, for the synthesis of extracellular matrix uh, components. Additionally, uh, the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway and the cellular redox state have been implicated in myofibroblast formation and the fibrotic phenotype. So therefore, we next asked uh, whether glutaminolysis or the breakdown of glutamine to uh, eventually alpha ketoglutarate is required for myofibroblast formation. To test this, we conditionally deleted GLS-1 uh, the first and committed step of glutaminolysis in fibroblasts containing LOXP sites that flank exon 1. Following addition of adenovirus expressing Cree recombinase in mouse embryonic fibroblasts, 
we observed a near complete loss in GLS protein expression. Deletion of GLS1 prevented myofibroblast formation as indicated by reduction in the number of alpha smooth muscle actin positive cells. Uh, as you can tell here in our black versus red bars with uh, TGF beta. Furthermore, while TGF beta resulted in contraction of collagen gel matrices, uh, black to black, um, re, uh, the deletion of GLS1 uh, prevented this phenotype. Uh, as glutamine contributes significantly to the biosynthesis of Krebs cycle intermediates, as I just showed, uh, we also assessed whether cellular, cellular bioenergetics uh, were altered following loss of GLS protein expression. And while uh, TGF beta increased both basal and ATP linked respiration, uh, the deletion of, of GLS1 in our mouse embryonic fibroblast prevented this TGF beta mediated increase as compared. Um, as we compare the red versus the uh, green bars here in this graph. Now, our previous studies uh, on Mickey one uh, focus on cardiac fibrosis. And because of this, we next wanted to ask whether this metabolic mechanism of differentiation was conserved um, from these more uh, naive uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts uh, to more uh, primary murine cardiac fibroblasts that would be found in the heart. Uh, to test this, we use a highly specific pharmacological inhibitor of glutaminase, uh, CB839, and determine the effects on myofibroblast formation. Pharmacolo pharmacological inhibition of GLS-1 significantly decreased both intracellular glutamate and alpha-ketoglutarate levels, uh, while increasing glutamine abundance, confirming GLS-1 inhibition by CB839. Uh, we found that inhibition of GLS-1 prevented myofibroblast formation, is indicated by reduction in collagen 1A1 expression, uh, as well as a decrease in alpha smooth muscle actin uh, positive cell populations, and a decrease in the ability of uh, TGF beta to stimulate collagen gel matrix contraction. So collectively, these results indicate that glutaminolysis is a essential metabolic pathway mediating myofibroblast activation and formation and that this pathway may be therapeutically targeted to treat cardiac fibrosis. Uh, as we previously shown that alpha-ketoglutarate dependent lysine demethylation is necessary for myofibroblast formation, uh, we next tested whether GLS-1 activity is required for the TGF beta mediated histone demethylation in fibroblasts. Inhibition of GLS-1 in primary cardiac fibroblasts was sufficient to prevent TGF beta mediated histone demethylation as quantified here uh, from protein immunoblotting. Now, importantly, while GLS-1 inhibition, as I just showed, prevents myofibroblast formation, uh, we performed a dimethyl alpha-ketoglutarate uh, rescue experiment, uh, which is a cell permeable uh, uh, form of alpha-ketoglutarate. And this was sufficient to rescue the myofibroblast phenotype as we see an increase in the uh, per pop percent population of alpha smooth muscle actin positive cells in the presence of uh, GLS-1 inhibition. So these data, in addition to our observed TGF beta mediated increases in chromatin accessibility that I showed earlier, uh, shed some mechanistic insight into the role of glutaminolysis and myofibroblast formation. Now, in collaboration with Dr. Kent Margulies at UPenn, we assessed the translational potential of blockade of glutaminolysis on the myofibroblast phenotype. Uh, in cardiac fibroblasts isolated from uh, both non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. So in these experiments, human cardiac fibroblasts were uh, co-treated with TGF beta and our GLS-1 inhibitor for 24 hours, after which uh, they were stained for either alpha-SMA positivity or assessed for uh, gene, gene program activation via qPCR. And as shown here, um, inhibition of glutaminolysis was sufficient to prevent the TGF beta mediated increases in alpha SMA expression and other fibrotic genes um, as we compare the red bars to the uh, green bars in all of these graphs. And although we did observe some heterogeneous responses here, um, for example, uh, here in the gene program between uh, explant number one and explant number two. Um, this is likely uh, due to differences in the disease severity and etiology. Um, and so 
even though that we do see some heterogeneous uh, responses, the response to GLS-1 inhibition on the myofibroblast phenotype uh, generally was conserved across all three patients here. So uh, in, in this summer, or in summary, uh, and this kind of concludes the, the JMCC manuscript here, um, but we show that the, uh, the therapeutic potential of targeting glutaminolysis to prevent myofibroblast formation under stress conditions and uh, this could provide a novel target to treat fibrosis and heart disease. And so to this point, we next asked, um, does in vivo targeting of glutaminolysis uh, decrease fibrosis and heart failure progression? So the greatest therapeutic potential of inhibiting glutaminolysis or any interventional um, uh, you know, strategy lies in the possibility of reversing fibrosis by de-differentiating activated myofibroblast post-injury under chronic stress stimuli. So we therefore tested if targeting GLS-1 in activated fibroblasts in vivo would lessen fibrosis and improve cardiac function in a mouse model of pressure overload heart failure. So to test this, we uh, crossed our GLS-1 flox flox mice with the periostin inducible Cree line developed by the Mulkinson lab and a Cree-dependent fluorescent uh, reporter line to both label and temporally delete GLS-1 exclusively in activated myofibroblasts post-differentiation. Uh, following 16 weeks of TAC, fact-sorted TD tomato positive cells uh, confirmed GLS-1 deletion via immunoblotting. Assessment of the peak aortic pressure differences and of the total number of TD tomato positive cells uh, isolated from these hearts revealed no differences between our two genotypes. And so this really helps to uh, show that we had equal stress uh, between both genotypes here. Uh, loss of glutaminolysis in activated myofibroblasts, however, uh, revealed the preservation of contractile function starting at the 10 week time point and on as indicated by our measurements of ejection fraction here uh, by echocardiography. Further characterization of the changes in cardiac function using B-mode speckle tracking uh, at the 16-week uh, post-tac time point revealed increased uh, radial strain rates during systole, indicating improved contractility. Importantly, we also observed an increase in the rate of relaxation indicated by the inverse radial strain rate, which is calculated during diastole. And so this finding really is important because diastolic dysfunction is highly correlated with tissue fibrosis. To this point, uh, we assessed collagen deposition via Picrosiris red, which revealed a significant increase in our uh, TAC animals, TAC control animals, which was prevented uh, following loss of glutaminolysis in these activated myofibroblasts. Importantly, collagen deposition was similar between groups at an earlier time point, uh, here six weeks post-TAC, confirming our hypothesis that fibrotic regression um, occurs following loss of glutaminolysis in these activated myofibroblasts, and that this really is reversing disease uh, progression. So again, we assess the translational potential of blockade of glutaminolysis on myofibroblast reversion uh, in cardiac fibroblasts isolated from our uh, patient explants. In these experiments, uh, human cardiac fibroblasts were maintained under chronic TGF beta stimulation for uh, 48 hours with glutaminolysis intervention at the 24 hour mark. Uh, these cells were then stained for alpha smooth muscle actin positivity and assessed for fibrotic gene program activation, again via PCR. Um, and as you can see here, inhibition of glutaminolysis was sufficient to revert these myofibroblasts back to a less fibrotic phenotype. Uh, as indicated by our red bars versus our, our orange bars in both of these uh, patient explanted uh, cardiac fibroblasts. Now, collectively, these results indicate um, the therape therapeutic potential of our metabolic intervention in not only preventing, um, but reversing cardiac fibrosis uh, in cardiovascular disease. So this leads us into the last question proposed at the start, uh, which is what I'm currently uh, pursuing in the lab, um, which is what is the source of glutamine utilized by these fibroblasts? Uh, and is, the, is fuel availability a regulatory mechanism in fibrosis or is it merely sufficient? In a uh, recent metabolomic study by our collaborator Zolta Rainey, uh, arterial coronary sinus differences in human heart failure 
revealed that of all the metabolites secreted by the human heart, human failing heart, glutamine uh, was the highest. And so additional evidence um, from Heinrich Tegmeier actually concluded that in the perfused working heart, transfer of carbons from glutamate to glutamine uh, does occur, yet the reverse process was undetectable, uh, suggesting that in uh, the adult heart in cardiomyocytes, there's very little uh, uptake and breakdown of glutamine. RNA-seq analysis of mouse hearts subjected to TAC or MINR lab revealed a significant increase in the expression of nearly all glutamine transporters indicated here um, and in GLUL, uh, specifically in our TAC, in our TAC model. Um, and this is the gene that encodes for glutamine synthetase. So these, these results here suggest the possibility of enhanced cardiac glutamine production and secretion in heart failure. And so to directly test the role of glutamine synthetase uh, in cardiac pathophysiology, we generated a cardiomyocyte-specific tamoxifen-inducible knockout model of glutamine synthetase and subjected these mice to pressure overload-induced heart failure. Loss of cardiomyocyte uh, glutamine synthesis preserved LV structure and function, uh, indicated here by fractional shortening measurements, and prevented uh, fibrotic infiltration uh, within the left ventricle. And so uh, these results suggest to us that there, there is a potential for a cardiomyocyte to fibroblast metabolic crosstalk mechanism uh, that mediates fibrosis and cardiac health. Uh, lastly, uh, we asked whether targeting glutamine synthetase after disease onset would rescue or mitigate heart failure progression. Uh, in this study, we waited eight weeks post-TAC um, prior to tamoxifen administration to induce cardiomyocyte-specific deletion of, of GS. Uh, again, aortic pressure differences uh, were no different between our groups, indicating uh, a significant or a similar stimuli. And as you can tell here by our uh, short axis fractional shorting measurements or our long axis uh, volumetric ejection fraction measurements, that these mice track very nicely up to this eight-week time point as far as their uh, decline in function goes. Um, but following administration of tamoxifen after eight weeks, uh, these groups do seem to separate, um, and we do seem to uh, observe a preservation of, of cardiac function uh, following loss of glutamine synthetase in the cardiomyocytes. And so now we're currently working to further phenotype these cohorts um, and have experiments planned to demonstrate uh, directly that cardiomyocyte derived glutamine uh, is contributing to myofibroblast formation, um, as well as exploring the cardiomyocyte specific protective effects um, of loss of glutamine synthetase and heart failure. And so um, in summary, myofibroblast differentiation is associated with these dynamic changes in chromatin accessibility, uh, primarily increased accessibility, um, which correlates with uh, activation of the fibrotic gene program um, and with our metabolic reprogramming that we observe. Uh, glutamine, glutamine metabolism is rapidly increased during fibroblast activation and is the primary carbon source uh, for the biosynthesis of the epigenetic modifying cofactor alpha ketoglutarate, um, as well as for the biosynthetic anabolic reactions, such as collagen biosynthesis and for ATP supply, which all supports uh, differentiation and uh, eventual tissue fibrosis. Uh, pharmacological inhibition and genetic disruption uh, prevents myofibroblasts and even reverses uh, myofibroblast formation. And this pheno phenomenon is recapitulated in fibroblasts from the human heart failure. And if we uh, target GLS-1 in vivo um, in these already activated fibroblasts, we can improve uh, and mitigate cardiac functional decline following pressure overload. And so Lastly, uh, cardiomyocyte-derived glutamine, uh, we feel could be a signal um, or a fuel that activates these fibroblasts to initiate fibrosis, as indicated by our GS deletion and cardiomyocyte studies. And now we're really trying to further expand on this by really trying to um, expand our understanding on metabolism and how this contributes uh, to fibroblast biology uh, and fibroblast differentiation and heart failure. And here's just a quick graphical summary of these conclusions. Um, which is constantly changing as we continue to work towards our, our full understanding of how metabolism directly contributes to cardiac disease progression and, and other possible targets um, that we can use to uh, promote cardiac health and improve outcomes in disease. 
Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank um, everyone in the Elrod lab, specifically uh, Dr. Elrod, my, my postdoc mentor, um, individuals of the uh, CTM here at Temple who have been very helpful with these studies as well, uh, collaborators at the University of Louisville, uh, UPenn and UCLA. Um, I'd like to thank the ISHR and American Heart Association, NIH, uh, for the funding that I've received and for the um, opportunity to present at, at a lot of the ISHR uh, conferences uh, most recently. So with that, I thank you all for listening and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Andrew. This was awesome. Uh, I love the fact that you actually gave the big picture, combining your papers together. Um, Thank you. Thanks. While I'm, we're waiting for others to chime in with questions, um, I, I have a couple for you. Uh, I, I guess we can do a private uh, Q&A session the whole rest of the day, but let me start <laughs> with a couple of the important burning questions in my head. Um, so far, you looked at the fibrotic aspect of uh, you know, fibroblasts and what they do with disease and clearly with this uh, uh, epigenetic changes. Uh, but have you looked at uh, other crosstalk with other cell types uh, in your setting? Uh, I, I don't know how much inflammatory uh, crosstalk you'll see in the TAC model. Maybe you're going into the failure stage. Maybe you'll see something. But um, for example, with MI model, um, mm -hmm. there's a huge flux of immune uh, cells. And there's a lot of uh, crosstalk between fibroblast and immune cells, right? And if you prevent this uh, differentiation, which you carefully call myofibroblast, so you're kind of specifically talking about the ECM aspect maybe, mm -hmm. but can you, uh, you know, comment on whether you have seen any changes if this crosstalk cytokine expression of fibroblast and, and how that can affect the physiology? Certainly. Um, so we haven't gone to, I mean, the, the crosstalk mechanism now that we're looking at, right, is the cardiomyocytes communicating with the fibroblast to promote their differentiation. Now, infiltrative cells such as, as macrophages or these immune cells can, can obviously activate fibroblasts themselves, right, through um, the secre production and secretion of, of TGF beta or other inflammatory cytokines that can you know, bind to uh, various receptors on fibroblasts and promote their differentiation. Um, lactate is another signal um, for fibroblast activation and differentiation as well, another metabolic signal, um, which we would think would be enhanced uh, during cardiac disease as, as glycolysis is increased and oxidative phosphorylation becomes compromised. Um, and these macrophages and immune cells are highly glycolytic as well. Um, so, so I think that there is certainly um, multiple metabolites of interest that could be um, contributing to uh, myofibroblast activation and things like that. And I am certain that there is things secreted um, from the fibroblast or myofibroblasts themselves that are then acting to either, uh, you know, dampen cardiomyocyte uh, function or to uh, enhance or promote, you know, the anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory uh, phenotype within the heart. Right. Um, next phase of the question maybe is probably out of your scope, but have you done this developmentally? Have you knocked it out uh, with a, I don't know, global fibroblast or, you know, TCF21 maybe, um, you know, post-birth like neonatal mice and look at the development of the heart? How much of this, uh, you know, metabolic activation pathway affects the growth of the heart? So we haven't done any developmental studies, um, but there are some studies, right, where uh, deletion of PDGF or alpha uh, positive cells, or at least there's some evidence, right, that if you delete the, at least that for portion of uh, fibroblast cells within the heart embryonically, that the hearts develop fine and there doesn't appear to be any developmental issues if you delete all these fibroblasts from the heart. Um, from birth, um, which is very interesting, uh, yeah. if, that, if that is yeah, true. Yeah. So, so exactly. So the, the question in hand, I guess, is, um, you know, we know that fibroblasts and cardiomyocytes communicate a lot in disease states. And, you know, we assume that there's a critical part of that in homeostatic too. Um, but, you know, if you look at Katrin Yatsi's work uh, from children's 
They have also knocked out the periostin expressing cells, the activated fibroblasts during that, uh, you know, so-called regenerative phase of the mouse uh, heart. And then they've seen a reduction in the cardiomyocytes with like, you know, proliferative markers, right? So there's something going on that I'm wondering. And, and I think you're referring to Michelle's uh, recent paper with the mm -hmm. of Alpha Naka. I'm not sure how much developmentally they got into it, uh, but yeah. like, I'm, I'm very curious, is this energetics and, and, and you know, metabolics of, of the fibroblast are the key to growth phases as well or not? You know what I mean? Certainly, yeah. So we did um, some proliferation. We did a proliferation assay uh, on these cells when we inhibit glutamine synthetic or glutamine glutaminase, um, and they do proliferate a little bit slower. But it's not, you know, it's not significant. Like it's not crazy that they proliferate fifty percent slower or anything. It was like ten percent slower. So there's still other mechanisms that allow these cells to um, proliferate. Now, what's interesting is that, um, for instance, if you uh, increase glycolysis in a fibroblast, um, either, you know, uh, uh, genetically or, well, specifically genetically, um, that this also promotes their differentiation. However, we see here that if we um, delete or pharmacologically inhibit uh, glutaminolysis, um, that doesn't affect uh, glycolysis in these cells in response to TGF-beta. So TGF-beta increases the glycolysis and glycolysis remains increased um, with inhibition of, of glutaminolysis. So to me, that, that says that, you know, while increased glycolysis is sufficient, it's not necessary, right? And that I think the link between glutaminolysis and glycolysis is, is what's really key. Um, and it seems that it's really this, gluten, this glutamine utilization that is, that is driving, um, you know, the activation of these cells in the heart. Yeah, I, I like that you're saying it. it's probably what's physiological versus artificial, right? I mean, if you yeah. start a fibroblast, they also activate. Like there's so many things we can stimulate these guys and activate, but what's happening in vivo physiologically is what you're referring. Exactly, yes. Right. Yes. So there is one question. Uh, what are the other pathways may get activated by pharmacological Ecological inhibition of glytomyelolysis. Um, so, like as I said, we know that. Um, so we kind of saw this intermittently, but it appears that if you inhibit glutaminolysis, uh, that you do get an increase um, in uh, glycolysis, and that's probably just to um, you know fuel ATP production, uh, fuel nucleotide and amino acid biosynthesis, lipid synthesis, um, in order to uh, maintain the proliferative capacity of these cells. Um, so we do know that that glycolysis is typically activated. Um, and we do know that with TGF-beta, we saw um, increases in several amino acids that were synthesized um, by our, our stabilized tub tracing. Um, and we did see um, nucleotides as well uh, being increased. And so you know, it's the metabolism stuff is certainly complicated because if you inhibit one pathway, a lot of other pathways, you know, are likely to change. Um, and, you know, we unfortunately aren't able to, to inhibit and look at every single pathway. Um, but we do know that that glycolysis is increased um, and that at least oxidative phosphorylation is prevented um, and that amino acid synthesis um, is reduced with glutaminolysis as well. Maybe there's another question coming up, but it <clears throat> got short, so I'll wait for that. Um, Ron has a question. I have, I have a question. So um, I can wait. It looks like the Q&A question just came on, so I'll ask mine after this one. Okay, so the question is, uh, I'm dyslexic, so I might butcher it, but I'll, I'll try my best. There's elementary reading skills here. Uh, <laughs> so what is the major energy substrate in fibroblasts, like fatty acids in cardiomyocytes? So it seems that at least the, the major energy substrate, at least one of them is, is glutamine. It's a primary one. Um, because specifically, if we, again, if we give TGF-beta, um, oxygen consumption rates are increased, uh, and this is directly tied to ATP production. 
basally. Um, and if we inhibit glutamine uh, utilization, that completely prevents uh, that increase. Now, the cells also use a ton of glucose. Um, so, and there's gonna be a ton of ATP that's generated um, from uh, uh, aerobic glycolysis. However, because we um, because we're seeing that these changes, because these cells are still oxidative, right? So they're not um, completely losing the ability to to become oxidative phosphorylation or generate ATP in the mitochondria. Um, but this seems to be independent of the ability of the cells to um, activate the fibrotic gene program, which is in the nucleus and involves the transcriptional machinery there. So at least, you know, in, in our culture conditions, um, we don't see, uh, we don't have fatty acids on board. So, so we know that they're not using fatty acids, at least in, in our in vitro system. Um, they do use py pyruvate um, and they do uptake, um, there's some literature that they do uptake uh, lactate um, and can use that as a fuel source um, for, for, again, both energy, but then also for synthesis of, of various uh, amino acids and, and things like that. Um, and I think there, there might be some literature out there. I think I saw one paper where they might even uh, utilize some branch chain amino acids. Ron? So, so my, I guess my question has to do with more the fibroblast contribution to the, the metabolic milieu of the heart as an organ. So you know, I think your work really uncovered something unexpected that fibroblasts are, are central players in metabolism. But what I'm, what I'm trying to wrap my head around is just on the per cell basis, you know, and other, other than really advanced injury, fibroblasts are not a large component of what makes up the heart. And so do you think in let's say an infarct or in an area of fibrosis in the tissue, are there subdomains of, met, of metabolic alteration? So I guess, in other words, how does the fibroblast or does the fibroblast as a cell type change the metabolic profile of the heart overall? Or do you think it's, you know, the myocytes in an area of fibrosis have an altered metabol metabolic profile compared to the rest of the myocytes? Um, that, and that is very interesting um, to think about in that capacity. Um, so we know that these fibroblasts, at least, you know, that are kind of more interstitial, right, are, are within and between the cardiomyocytes um, and could kind of be farther away from any capillaries or blood supply, right? So within those little, uh, I guess we can call them like fibroblast niches or something, right, um, they could be really dependent or reliant on anything that is secreted by the cardiomyocytes. And so that's kind of where we think this glutamine um, secretion by the cardiomyocytes and the utilization by the fibroblasts where that really uh, lies and has impact because glutamine in the circulation is, is the highest amino acid in circulation. It's 200 to 600 micromolar. Um, and so it's really not limiting. Um, but if these fibroblasts are away from that source or if the cardiomyocytes really are releasing uh, excessive amounts of glutamine, those local concentrations could be much higher. And then we know that the fibroblasts are uh, highly aerobically uh, glycolytic and release a lot of lactate. And the fibroblasts could be using that lactate uh, as an additional uh, fuel source, uh, potentially, um, to help try and drive as much ATP production as possible and try and limit the energetic uh, deficit that the, that's going on. But as far as you know, testing these things are very, very difficult, as you can imagine. Um, so I'd have to really think about how we would be able to test metabolites coming from the fibroblasts that could be influencing the metabolism of a cardiomyocyte. And maybe, maybe it's as simple as, you know, deletion studies of, of cardiac fibroblasts, um, from the heart entirely. Um, but then you're going to probably run into other issues that, that you can't really then tease out exactly what's going on. Coming back to that uh, regionality, um, I, I have a question about uh, the model you used in your previous paper with the TAC model. Um, have you so you showed that interstitial fibrosis kind of goes away a little bit, right? Um, um, a couple questions, right? Number one, 
Uh, did you see a reduction in number of fibroblasts active at that time with the fluorescent reporter you used? That's so we did. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it didn't seem like we saw a reduction, at least based on our fact sorting um, shown here between our two groups. Right. Um, so we don't think that, you know, with this uh, deletion system um, that we're getting a less of a fibrotic response because we're um, we have less activation. Right. Okay. So we don't think Perfect. it's that. And the um, the half-life of GLS-1 in vivo is proposed to be about, um, I want to say it's 5.1 or so days. So that's going to be about 21 days, roughly before it's completely gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the TAC models, you know, all these cells are going to come out at, at various different times. So it's not just going to be like an MI large insult of fibrosis. This is very like gradual um, and, and gradual accumulation of fibrosis, which is why we think that, you know, we don't really see a change here until later, um, change in function here until later in our model system, um, because we think that at this point, some, somewhere in this six to eight to 10 week range is where we're, we're, we're getting optimal uh, fibroblast activation, we're getting optimal fibrosis, and then we're getting the start of optimal deletion of GLS-1 and fibrotic reversion, um, which is supported here by our hydroxyproline assay results that at the six week, we really don't see any difference in, in fibrotic uh, accumulation. Um, but then after, um, after that point and later in disease, when we start to see that functional change, um, that we do see the, the fibrotic regression. Right. That, um, the second phase of this is um, of the interest of uh, different subpopulation of fibroblasts, if you believe in them or not. But do yeah. you see the perivascular fibrotic response in the TAC model that you're using? Does it disappear as much as the interstitial one? So we haven't looked specifically at that, um, but I know that, and I think it might be from you potentially, is that the uh, periostin um, expression doesn't really correlate too well with the perivascular fibroblasts. Uh, I think you had a poster at that a couple of years ago. Um, and so what we're trying to really understand uh, is these different cell populations and, and what's really occurring at the local versus the uh, non-local. Um, one thing that I would uh, think is that, especially within our um, glutamine synthetase deletion model, is that, as I mentioned, since the uh, circulating levels of glutamine are so high, the perivascular fibroblasts could likely not be affected um, by the deletion of GS in our cardiomyocytes. And so we are looking to um, try and do uh, not only histological analysis of that, but then also some single cell uh, seek analysis to see how does deletion of GS in the cardiomyocytes affect the populations? And is it only interstitial versus perivascular or is it all around? All right. Yeah, we can go on and on, but uh, Ron, <laughs> I think uh, we can wrap this up. Uh, otherwise, it's going to turn into like another PhD uh, thesis uh, exam. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Always a pleasure to see your work. And Thanks, we'll guys. Be looking out for your next publications. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone, Thank you, everyone for joining today. Have a great day. Thanks.